It's a hot summer day here in Seoul. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm your host, Lee ji Before we get started, let's see what we have lined up for you in the latter half of our program. We sit down with an expert to talk about sliding commodities in the face of weaker global demand and uncertainties in China. How will this all affect the Korean economy? Korea's top 30 business groups saw their operating profits sink last year amid flat domestic demand and troubled exports. No new MERS infections in 23 consecutive days and zero suspected patients under quarantine. With this, the Korean government has declared a de facto end to the coronavirus outbreak that took the lives of 36 people. Prime Minister Hwang kyo won made the announcement on Tuesday, nearly 10 weeks after the first reported case. Apologizing for the government's poor initial response, he promised a thorough investigation and encouraged people to return to daily activities on all fronts. One patient remains in the hospital receiving treatment amid inconclusive test results. An official end is expected to be announced next month in line with the WHO-mandated 28-day infection-free waiting period. And this latest de facto end to the MERS outbreak is certainly welcome news for businesses in the country that shouldered the impact this year, as already they've seen operating profits nosedive last year. Our right, Kim Ji-yeon has this report. Korea's top 30 business groups saw their profitability tumble in 2014, mainly due to sluggish domestic demand and exports. Their combined operating profit stood at 49.2 billion U.S. dollars last year, a near 35 percent plunge from 2010, according to data compiled by corporate tracker Table.com. The business group's combined operating profit last year was even lower than what it was during the global financial crisis in 2008. Some, including LG Group and Postco Group, saw their operating profits drop by nearly half last year from 2008. The group's operating margin, the ratio of operating income to total revenue, also stood at 4 percent, nearly half of that recorded in 2010. Chebel.com says the groups have enjoyed the fruits of favorable government-led currency exchange policies and stimulus measures effective through 2012. NH Investment and Securities Company told Solvay's Yonan News Agency that global demand needs to pick up to improve the group's profitability. But there was some good news for these groups earlier this week when Finance Minister Che Gyeon projected Korean exports would improve in the second half to a trade volume of $1 trillion. During the first half of this year, outbound shipments dropped 5 percent from the same period last year to $269 billion. Kim Jeon, Business Daily. Now, the smart home market is expected to grow by leaps and bounds in the years to come. And to get a foot in the door, local consumer electronics giants are shifting their focus to get connected. Our Sun jung in tells us more. The market for smart home appliances or smartwares is expected to see strong growth over the next five years. According to market researcher IHS, the global market for smartwares is projected to grow at a compound annual rate of 134 percent. Sales of white goods such as washing machines, dishwashers, refrigerators and air conditioners are expected to jump to more than 223 million units worldwide by 2020 from fewer than a million units last year. Add to that smaller home appliances like coffee machines and rice cookers, and the total number of smart devices is expected to hit 700 million in five years. Given the explosive growth projections, domestic consumer electronics giants like Samsung and LG Electronics are vying to gain a competitive advantage in the sector, and they've shifted their focus from mobile devices and televisions to smart home technology devices. Samsung Electronics has set a goal of connecting all of its products and devices via the Internet of Things in the next five years. LG has connected appliances such as refrigerators and washing machines to the Internet of Things, enabling them to connect to service centers if technical problems arise. The market researcher predicts the smart home technology market will become consolidated within the next two to three years with just a couple of connectivity platforms, operating systems, and a small number of technology-oriented appliance companies dominating the market. Chun Jung-in, Business Daily. 
Meanwhile, the government announced it will extend by a year relaxed rules on loans in a bid to further stimulate the housing market and prop up the local economy. The Financial Supervisory Service said that it will hold the loan to value ratio at 70 percent and debt to income ratio at 60 percent after their ease to create more room for borrowing last August. The two ratios help control the amount of mortgage and loans available to borrowers based on their income and ability to pay back debt. Despite the significant level of household debt, financial authorities believe that effects from the extension will outweigh debt risks. It's no secret that finding a job fresh out of college is challenging for many young people here in Korea these days. But how difficult is it really? The realities are outlined in the new figures released by the nation's statistics agency. And our Eunice Kim breaks down the numbers for us. More than half of college graduates fresh out of school land their first jobs in under three months. But for those who aren't so lucky, the hunt drags on, taking them beyond a year. Most don't hold on to those first jobs for long either. Of those 4 million who were able to find employment, a whopping 63 percent had already quit their first jobs, with their average longevity at a year and a half. The top reason for walking away were conditions related to the work. Half of those who quit said they were unhappy with their wage and or working hours, while 17 percent cited personal reasons, such as marriage or having a child. Others simply said their contract had ended. And we're seeing a noticeable shift in where this year's young job seekers are aiming their luck. About a third said they're preparing for exams related to government jobs, a growth of 7 percent on year, in contrast with a 7 percent dip in those who are preparing to enter private companies. Perhaps it's the view that public jobs are stable, but they certainly won't be an easy get. This year, central and city governments say they will fill 22,000 entry-level positions. But about 220,000 are expected to apply for those positions, highlighting the reality of the job market wars. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. And now let's see how the markets fared here in Seoul today. Seoul shares ended a tad bit higher on Tuesday as institutions hunted for bargains despite a weak start over plunging Chinese shares. At the closing bell, the benchmark Kospi inched up 0.01 percent to finish at 2039, while the tech-heavy Kosdaq lost 0.77 percent to end at 745. On the foreign exchange counter, the Korean currency gained ground against the greenback, ending at 1,164.91. The pullback in commodity prices seems to be already sending waves across financial markets and the global economy. And in the face of such fluctuations, the question now is, how big of an impact will this have on the Korean economy? Let's find out. Global crude oil prices recently dipped to a four-month low, while the price of gold plunged to its lowest level in five years. The Bloomberg Commodity Index touched levels unseen since June 2002. Major indices in Frankfurt and Paris, along with London's FTSE 100, all tumbled on Monday as Chinese shares continued to plummet, knocking down commodity prices as well. Experts say much of this simply comes from too much supply and not enough demand for these commodities like oil and gold. Along with insipid demand, the slowdown in China the world's biggest energy consumer and major oil importer is another factor rattling the global commodity market. Expectations that the U.S. Federal Reserve will carry out a rate hike soon and added supply that may spill out from the recent nuclear deal with Iran have also fueled downward pressure on metals and oil. Amid growing concerns about the health of the global economy, what kind of effects will this have on Korea? And to tell us more about this, we're now joined by Professor Yang Jun Sok from the Catholic University of Korea. So good to have you join us today. Happy to be here. All right, so what kind of effects have we seen so far this 
commodity prices falling have on the global economy? Okay, well, I think the uh, fall in the commodity prices is not necessarily a cause, but rather an effect. Mm. I think uh, the uh, falling prices reflect the fact that uh, the investors, the people who invest in commodities, do not see a recovery in the near future, and also they do not see inflation uh, possibility in the future. So they've cut back on investing, buying uh, commodities uh, and commodities futures, and I think that is having an effect on some of the uh, commodity exporting countries. But as Korea is concerned, it it's. Uh, it's not exactly a help to us, but it's not exactly a harm to us either. So it washes out. Uh, but what is worrying is that it does seem like the uh, markets and the investors think that recovery is not near. Mm. All right. Well, this must be obviously like what you said, um, bad news for commodity exporting countries. What's the situation like there? OK, well, uh, for country, oil exporting countries like uh, Russia and Venezuela, they're having major uh, economic problems mm. uh, for other commodity exporting countries, countries which export metals and agricultural goods like Brazil, Chile, Colombia, uh, they're not uh, not as bad off, but still their exports are either falling or not rising as quickly. So that's not helping the uh, global market. All right. Well, now we want to know how will this all affect the Korean economy? I mean, you mentioned a little bit that it's not really a harm, but it's not really a help either. But. Yeah, Korea, uh, we always say that Korea is a resource poor country except mm -hmm. for uh, workers. Uh, so having a low price for raw material commodities, uh, for uh, energy commodities, it's not uh, bad news for us. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think most analysts and myself uh, tend to see the low prices as being a result of two factors. One is that uh, the inflationary factors do not seem people are not seem to worry about inflation uh, in the near future. And sometimes commodities act as a hedge against inflation. Mm. So th that accounts for some of the fallen prices. But also, commodity prices are tied to the current economic mm. uh, growth and future expected growth. And one of the, I think the major reason why the commodity prices are so low is that they really do not expect much of a growth in the future. So Korea being an exporting country, uh, even though commodity prices are not expensive, uh, if there's no demand for Korea's exports, mm. we really can't do much with cheap price uh, commodities and raw material. So it sort of washes out, I think. Unless you happen to be uh, driving for your vacation, then right. you know, cheap oil prices will yes. help you. OK, well, how about we get an outlook of the global commodity market? Um, let's start with oil. Global crude oil prices have been hovering around $50 per barrel. Do you think it's going to continue to fall? Or what's well, your outlook on that? Well, uh, after the OPEC made its decision to uh, uh, maintain its prices low last year, it's fallen to the $40, uh, $40 level, as you mentioned, but it has been rising a little bit this mm -hmm. year. Uh, but uh, because of the uh, lackluster uh, global economy overall, mm -hmm. and remember that OPEC is not the biggest player anymore. You have Russia, uh, who is in a big pro uh, economic problem right now. And uh, so those factors, I think, are keeping the uh, prices low. Uh, there's also Iran, who's been shut out of the uh, global uh, oil markets, and they're coming back in. So I think right now the money is on oil prices falling a bit uh, in the near future. All right. Well, at the center of all this is obviously China, um, the world's top energy consuming nation. How is the Chinese economy affecting the global commodity market? Well, the Financial Times went as far as saying that the uh, slowdown in growth in China is the biggest reason for the uh, fallen commodities. Mm -hmm. uh, but they consume uh, more than half of global coal supply. They uh, consume more than half of global metal. Uh, but also remember that the re one of the reasons that they're consuming all this is not just for their domestic growth, but also to fuel their exports. And as uh, the uh, global market is not doing that well, uh, Chinese exports are also not doing that well. So it sort of feeds on to each other. All right. Well, a little bit about gold. Why, why are gold prices falling? OK, gold, I think, is a bit different from other commodities. Gold is really seen as sort of an alternative to currency investments. and. 
I think the biggest driver there is that the United States is expected to raise its interest rate in the near future. So if the uh, returns to dollar priced uh, investments go up, then there's no real demand for as much gold as before. So uh, I think that's really being driven by the expectations of changes in the United States interest rate. All right. Um, going back to Korea, what can the Korean government do in order to, I guess, minimize negative impacts that could possibly come from this falling commodity prices? Okay. Well, well, I, as I mentioned, I think the uh, low commodity prices sort of washes itself out when it comes to Korea. Uh, it's always good having cheaper raw material, but we need to uh, make goods and sell the goods, mm -hmm. and uh, there, there's not that much demand overall. Uh, but Korea is always being mentioned as a resource poor country. They always mention that we should stockpile some natural resources, especially oil, uh, so that we can control uh, domestic prices a bit more, stabilize it more. Mm -hmm. So this might be a good time to start stockpiling some of the resources since the prices have been uh, never been lower than this uh, since 2002 or 2004. So it might be a good time to uh, stockpile what we can. And for those we can stockpile, maybe buy into some futures so that we can lock in some of these low prices uh, for hopefully uh, recovery in the domestic economy. All right. Thank you so much for your insight today, Professor. Thank you. And that wraps it up for today. Thank you so much for staying with us throughout our program. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time, same place. Until then, goodbye.